This is part one of a special two-part podcast series with Matt Silverman, where we take up trade compliance. Matt is the Global Trade Director and Senior Counsel for Trade Compliance, and we take a deep dive into this uh, lesser-known area of compliance, but we find a lot of application to compliance literally across the board. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode, and today I have with me Matt Silverman. Uh, Matt is a trade compliance guy, and I don't get to talk to trade compliance guys enough mm-hmm. or gals. And uh, I thought this would be great for Matt to come on um, and talk about uh, trade compliance, the kind of overall climate around uh, that type of compliance today, and of course, pontificate on the University of Michigan football team. So, Matt, <laughs> uh, first of all, with an incredibly long winded welcome. Uh, Go Blue, and welcome to the podcast. Go Blue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go Blue. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be on with you. I thank you for the, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I know I've, I've watched it before, and I don't often see a lot of uh, trade compliance professionals. So it's nice, uh, it's nice to join and, and talk on that subject today. Uh, Matt, we've already identified you as a Wolverine, but could you tell us the rest of your educational and your uh, uh, professional background? Sure. So I um, I'm from the Chicago area originally. So I, I grew up a I grew up a Northwestern Wildcats fan, which is a tough team to root for. Um, and grew up in Evanston, Illinois. Um, went to high school there, and then went to um, college, as you mentioned, at Michigan. Uh, went right after that to law school in in Chicago at Loyola. And uh, for about four years, I practiced as a civil litigator. I, I like to say that I, I guess I'm a recovering asbestos asbestos attorney. Um, I used to do a lot of asbestos litigation on the defense side. Um, uh, it wasn't for me. No no offense to my, to my former colleagues, many of whom I still keep in touch with who still do it. But it was um, after doing it for four years, uh, med mal and some personal injury uh, but mostly asbestos litigation. I, I, um, I decided it wasn't for me and made a, I think, probably a non-traditional uh, leap to um, international trade via um, an LLM program at Georgetown. Usually LLMs, I think, are reserved for or more common for foreign attorneys in the U.S., um, sometimes tax lawyers. And I had a, a good friend of mine who I was at law school with who went to Georgetown to get his LLM in tax and I knew I didn't want to be a tax lawyer. Um, I always had an interest in international affairs, politics, things like that. Uh, and and I looked at their international trade program there and thought, well, that could be a, an interesting way to to kind of change my focus. So since about 2012, I have been in in one way or another in the international trade sphere. I started off working on uh, more more kind of policy issues, both on the Hill and for the U.S. Trade Representative. And then eventually made my way into the corporate corporate world, and now um, now I'm the um, the director of global trade compliance at a company called Viavi Solutions. We're a telecommunications and technology company based here in Arizona, where I am. Um, I've worked in the aerospace and defense industry, uh, oil and gas at Baker Hughes for a, for a couple years in Houston, uh, and the semiconductor industry as well. So I've been doing this for about. Um, a little, I guess, a little over ten years now, uh, primarily focused on international trade, international trade compliance. Matt, uh, I know it might shock you to find, but there may not be people who understand what trade compliance is. Yeah. So, before we go into any specific topics, could you really describe for us and for the audience uh, what is the breadth and scope of trade compliance? And I will introduce that with for my sins. Once I was appointed the export control director or a multinational energy company. So I have some knowledge of the breadth and scope of the types of things you do. Okay, fair enough. Um, so um, uh, the I guess global trade or international trade compliance can uh, be categorized, or sometimes it is kind of uh, put into four different areas. Uh, some of them obviously intersect, but there's export compliance, there's import or um, customs compliance, there's uh, sanctions, and then there's anti-boycott. So a lot of um, intersection between the four of those, and, and, and there's also some other areas as well that can 
you know, potentially fall within that. But that's, those are kind of the four areas where I practice in, where I have in the past. Um, when we talk about export compliance, obviously a part of that is um, being compliant in what we are physically shipping from one country to another, putting something in a box, um, letting the logistics people take care of the logistics, but making sure we are compliant in terms of getting any kind of licenses or authorizations we might need based on the classification of the product, right? So the the type of product that it is, how it's classified under the applicable, um, if it's U.S., U.S., if it's from another country, um, whatever the applicable uh, regulations are. Um, a, a big piece of export compliance, though, is also non-physical, non-tangible products. So the transfer of technology, for example, to a, um, it could be to a non-U.S. person. So the scope of U.S. export compliance is extraterritorial, uh, meaning we don't, we don't, we aren't just concerned about what is leaving this country. Um, we're also concerned with U.S. controlled products and technologies outside of the U.S. and where those products or where those technologies are being shared. So sharing information with um, even a foreign national in the U.S. could have export compliance concerns and considerations. Obviously, another piece of that is import or customs. Um, Part of that is I'm sure some people are aware of when we talk about things like duty and tariffs, things like that, being aware of um, what what types of duty we may have to pay, um, possibly changing our supply chain or being aware, aware of supply chain issues and how those could impact the duties that we pay. There's also a piece of that that is related to um, supply chain security. We do um, work at my current company and in the past with um, customs in a, a, a program called CTPAT, which is uh, does a lot with um, security of of our supply chain, supply chain preventing you know terrorism threats and things like that. So customs is a is a is a wide um, uh, scope just within itself. And then there's of course sanctions. Um, Under the Trump administration, which we may talk about, there were, I think, uh, that administration literally set a record for the number of sanctions that were imposed on individuals, um, parties, organizations, who we can and can't specifically do business with. So not just countries in general, but specifically certain parties, entities, individuals that are sanctioned. And, And just like any other area of global trade compliance, there are U.S. sanctions, there are EU sanctions, there are U.K. sanctions. There are a lot of different um, geographic areas we have to be aware of. And then the last piece of it that sometimes gets overlooked um, and is sometimes a little more applicable to certain industries than others is anti-boycott compliance. So when I was at Baker Hughes in the oil and gas industry, we did a lot of work, obviously, in the Middle East, and we had to be very aware of anti-boycott issues that would come up. So just very briefly, um, the U.S. has uh, laws on the books uh, basically stating that if you are a U.S. company, you cannot agree to any kind of boycott language. So if you're doing business with a boycotting country, so for example, Iraq has boycott laws on the books that say you will not do business with Israeli contractors or Israeli companies, et cetera. Well, that's perfectly fine for them to have those laws on the books, but we can't uh, we can't bid on a contract or, or agree to a contract that has boycott language in it. So a big piece of what I did especially in the past, but it's also something I keep aware of now is, uh, is making sure that we are compliant with all of the anti-boycott laws and regulations. So that's, that's trade compliance in a nutshell. Um, a, a lot, each of those topics in itself, uh, you could probably talk uh, a lot more about, but that's kind of a good example of what it is. Sometimes it gets confused with um, logistics, which is more operational, uh, but, uh, but that's, a, that's pretty much trade compliance in a summary. Matt, the, uh, your reference to the Trump administration really led to the area I wanted to explore with you in a couple of different ways. Number one, uh, my observation was that sanctions and perhaps other trade control issues sometimes changed multiple times a day during the Trump administration as a matter of policy. And it, I don't think it was Donald Trump driving it, it uh, perhaps others. Nevertheless, it was extraordinarily dynamic. The second thing was my other observation was that the role of someone like yourself, a trade compliance uh, director, uh, really became 
not only much more important, but much more prominent because of this plethora of sanctions and having to to literally pivot and, and maybe even a game of twister in the middle of this uh, going forward. is Would, would those, either or both of those observations be fair from where you sat on the in-house side? We'll be right back with more from Matt Silverman after this quick message. Look, 2020 has proven to be the year of many things, and the same for 2022. But if you're a small business, this could also be the year you switch to a better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses, it was built for the people behind them. Their online payroll is easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all your payroll taxes, which means you have more time to run your business. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto helps with time tracking, health insurance, 401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, access to HR experts. You get the idea. It's super easy to set up and get started. If you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. It's no surprise that 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto. And here's the best part. Because you're a listener to this podcast, you get three months totally free. All you have to do is go to gusto.com backslash compliance. That's gusto.com backslash compliance. I'm telling you, you're going to love Gusto. Get started today. Yeah, I mean that's that's very true. Um, and and honestly, even before the Trump administration, um, there were um, really when I the first time I remember really sanctions issues becoming for me in my career, um, not only a big issue but something that took up a a a lot of time uh, was the um, the sanctions against um, Russia and specifically with Ukraine with the um, annexation of of Ukraine, and that's where in the oil and gas industry. Um, that was really something that evolved relatively quickly, and a lot of quick decisions had to be made from a business standpoint in terms of um, where we could continue to do business, uh, the winding down periods, how long we could continue to do business with certain parties that were now sanctioned um, in oil and gas. It had to do with the type of work that was involved, so deep um, um, deep water shale projects, et cetera, things like that, um, which is part of the complication sometimes with sanctions is that we're not just talking about, it's not always straightforward. It's not always, it's just this party. You can't do business anymore. Well, you can do business with this party or that party, depending on the type of work that you're doing. So then you start getting into end use issues and, and getting end use certificates and doing due diligence, even if, a uh, if an end user says they're using your products for this service or that, are they really? And what's your obligation um, to to look into that a little bit further? So even before the Trump administration, um, there were a lot of sanctions issues that were um, uh, became more prominent, not just in Russia, but other areas as well, uh, especially under the Trump administration. You had um, obviously um, uh, tariff issues as well with new duties being imposed, but a plethora of new sanctions. Um, I, I, I literally think, and I don't have the exact metrics, but someone did the math and it was like three average of three new sanctions a day when you really included all the different individual people that were being sanctioned in that administration. So, um, you know, to some extent it's, it's easy to track and, 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 and for the most part, most of the sanctions that, that come down are related to specific people and entities that you may not have any business with, and it may not have that large of an impact on your company. Um, but to another extent, um, certainly when we're talking about comprehensive sanctions and especially sanctions that are related to the type of work that you're doing and um, not just the specific parties themselves, but the end use, um, that, that's where it can get um, especially, especially complicated and require a lot more due diligence on, on your company's part. Um, more recently, I'd say... Um, there has been a, um, I, I don't, I don't want to say a slowdown. It, it certainly Biden has not matched the amount of um, sanctions that have been imposed. Um, although um, there has been under the Biden administration, 
Um, new sanctions that have been imposed with regard to Russia. We actually just had issues uh, with regard to some sanctions that were imposed with regard to Belarus and the um, and the elections that went on there. And not only specific individuals, but but entire industries within the telecommunications industry, where again we had to look at whether or not we could continue to supply certain products based on what their end use was. So not just the individual party, um, but can we sell to this party? Well, they're sanctioned, but really are we, what we're supplying to them, is it really being used for the purpose um, under the applicable sanctions regime? And we had different sanctions to look at from a U.S. standpoint versus a U.K. standpoint and an EU standpoint. Um, but under the, the Biden administration, there, there have been some sanctions that have been rolled back on individual persons and entities. Uh, the administration has certainly not kept up with the pace of the previous one. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a lot of the same issues, uh, for example, with regard to Huawei um, and the export restrictions that are in place there. Those, those continue to be in place from one um, from one administration to the next in terms of the uh, our government's view on on Huawei and and whether or not we can continue to supply to them, which for the time being uh, we can't supply anything that is that is U.S. export controlled. So um, it's it's been an interesting few years, especially under the Trump administration, but even but even before and under the current one as well. It's it's always an evolving area, and 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 it does, as you said, it leads to a I think a level of complexity. And, and there's more visibility now at the top, whereas in the past, I think um, sometimes export compliance and trade compliance did not have that much visibility in the C-suite. Uh, it was looked at more of a, a, a function of or a piece of logistics or went along with logistics. And now it's being understood as, um, one, that there are there is serious reputational damage to be had and also, of course, serious financial implications for um, for violations of, of of export, import and and sanctions, sanctions violations. So as a as a trade compliance professional, I have to say um, as much as the. Changing regs and complexity can add um, can keep me up at night and can and can be difficult to manage. It also is nice to have that visibility and I think in in my current position and in previous positions really really to have a, almost a direct line to our general counsel to our c suite to our to our CEO um, because they're keeping updated on those issues as well they they're they're staying you know up to date on what's going on with China. And especially now with our um, with the with the world's issues with supply chain, um, there's a lot of focus there as well. Um, as we have to possibly shift supply chains and who we source from, making sure that we can do that in a compliant way. There are all different areas where trade compliance really intersects with the business, which gives it much more much more visibility at the top level of uh, of the organization. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. But this is only part one of a special two-part series with Matt Silverman. So I hope you will join me again next week where Matt and I take a deep dive into some specifics around trade compliance programs and how trade compliance can be used by a broad variety of compliance professionals to help inform their compliance program. We got a new great podcast out on the Compliance Podcast Network called Effie Argentina. This is based upon a book by Greg Greenberg, who is my co-host for this new podcast. And we take a look at stories of exasperation in modern America. If you're exasperated, this is the podcast for you. Effing Argentina on the Compliance Podcast Network. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.